I'm Jim Ayler. I'm going to tell you a story. Now, this story, it goes right up to the line, but it doesn't cross the line. And I'm going to trust you. I don't know why I'm going to trust you with this, but I'm going to trust you not to take it over the line, okay? Can I trust everybody here? If I can't trust you, please stand. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> so here's the story. I met this guy a few years ago, and some, he's older than I am, but something that happened to him in college, and before anybody ever meets this guy, they hear, this is the guy that this happened to. Well, what was it? Well, back when he was in college, he uh, saw this girl that sort of caught his attention on campus, and uh, so he started making his moves, and over a few weeks, he kind of got to know her a little more. And a little, finally, he got up his nerve, and he asked her out, and she said yes, and then the real nervousness came along because it was the old first date nervousness. And so he said to his roommate, look, why don't you and your girlfriend come with me and we'll make it a double date kind of thing. So that's what they planned to do. So they went, they took the girls to a nice dinner and then after the dinner they took them to the movies. And while they were at the movies, he had to go to the restroom. But now remember, this was 50 years ago before you could say things like, restroom. I mean, that was just way off limits. In fact, you had to kind of act like there were, you, you had no bodily functions at all. And so he didn't know quite what to do, but then he came up with this plan. I know, I'll go get popcorn. So he takes popcorn orders from everybody. He gets up, he heads back to the lobby, hits the restroom, grabs the popcorn and the drinks. He's got his hands loaded with this stuff. He comes back down and he... Uh, he starts moving, well, he's going this way. He, the screen's back there. He's kind of moving like this, and uh, uh, he gets to his roommate, and when he gets to his roommate, his roommate does that. And you know what that is. That's the universal sign for your zippers down. And he goes, oh, no. But then he comes up with a plan. He turns, he faces the screen, and he uh, passes out the popcorn, and he takes a few more, and then the, suddenly, you know how it gets dark in movies at places. He waits for that moment. He reaches down, zips up his zipper. He goes, great, this is great. And everything's fine until he takes two more steps. And then the girl with the long blonde hair sitting in front of them goes, ah, 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 like that. Well, the commotion level starts up immediately, and the big football player guy that the girl with the long blonde hair is with is having a little trouble understanding what's going on, and so the stress level kind of rises. Uh, they can't get the hair out of the zipper. Finally, uh, the usher comes down, and all the usher does is find, shine a flashlight on the problem so everybody in the theater now knows what's going on. And they can't get the hair out of the zipper, so finally they have to go all the way back to the lobby with this poor girl, her head bent down, going like that. Now, why, I know you're saying, why would you tell us that story? Why would I tell you that story? Well, the reason is, is because you cannot convince me that when that happened, God didn't laugh. <laughs> Throw all the theology you want to at me. But I got to tell you, God laughed at that. In fact, Psalm 2 says, the enthroned in heaven laughs. And that makes a lot of people, they're a little questioning about that. They cannot imagine that God would laugh. It surprises a lot of people to find out that God is joyful. And I guess the reason for that is, well, frankly, most adults, well, they're sad. In fact, a lot of church people are sad. As one guy said, you look like you've been baptized in prune juice, you know? In fact, a lot of church people that I know remind me of the elder brother in the prodigal son story. You remember the prodigal son came home, and, and they're going to throw a party about that? And, and this guy says, I am not going to party. I am not going to be happy. I'm just not going to do it. And he refuses to be joyful. But I want to tell you, in fact, the whole message today is about this. God is the most joyful being in the universe. God is is the most joyful being in the universe. It's not Jim Carrey. It's not even Simmons or Richard Simmons. God is the most joyful person being in the universe. All right, you're looking at me like, prove it to me. Galatians chapter 5 has a list of things that, that people that hang out with God, they sort of catch. They're called the fruits of the Spirit. And you see people, you know how, how it is when you hang out with people, you start catching their characteristics. 
Like we have an aunt that lives in Ireland, and, and after she calls, you know, for the next three days, I have an Irish accent. You know, we just sort of catch these things. Well, people that hang out with God catch his characteristics. And so the list goes like this. It starts with love. Why? Because God is love. And so people that hang out with God, they catch that. Another one is peace. I mean, Jesus is the prince of peace. So, of course, that's on the, God is patient. God's the most patient being in the universe. And people that hang out with God are patient. So what's number two on the list? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things that God are, people get. Well, God is joyful. He's the most joyful being in the universe. Or go to Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, to get giddy, you don't have to get drunk with wine. Just be filled with the Holy Spirit. When God lives in you, you're joyful. In fact, God's book, the Bible, it has a lot to say about joy. Pollyanna was right. There are over 200 glad passages in the Bible. And those 200 glad passages don't include all the festivals where, where God says, uh, I want you to stop every now and then, and I want you to have a festival. You know what a festival is? It's a party. I want you to just stop and have a party. I want you to celebrate. Also, it doesn't uh, include all the times in the Bible where the word wine represents joy. In fact, 200 of the 264 times the Bible refers to wine, wine represents joy. In fact, the old, uh, the old uh, rabbis used to say, Without wine, there is no joy. Wine represents joy in the scriptures. Go to John chapter 2. You remember what Jesus did there? He said, fill those pots with water. Now, scholars say that those pots held between 72 and 180 gallons. And what did Jesus do with the water? He turned it into wine. In fact, I think another time when God laughed, was when they served what they thought was water to the, <laughs> and it turned out to be wine. I bet God laughed at that too. So, joy is all through the scripture. And that doesn't even include all the times that people dance for joy. The first church I pastored was an inner city church, and uh, there was a lady, I won't say she was a part of the church really, because, well, I knew her in the neighborhood, you know, it was inner city church, there was a lot of people that lived around the church, and, and I knew her from there, I, her name was Thelma, and Thelma, I think she was like a, 160 years old, somewhere around that, and uh, she was one of those little old ladies in tennis shoes, just a lot of energy, you know, everywhere, and, uh, and I got to know her out in the neighborhood, but, and she'd come to church maybe once a month, and whenever she came to church, she would uh, kind of sneak in after the, church, after the service started and sit near the back, and then she'd sneak out real fast before it ended, and it was like she wasn't supposed to be there. But one Sunday, I, I was doing a baptism, and so in the middle of the service, I was in the back hall, and everybody else was in the sanctuary, and as I come around the corner, there's Thelma standing in the hallway. And she sees me, and she, her eyes get bright, and she looks around, and she ducks into this classroom. Well, now I knew I had her because there weren't any exits out of the classroom. So I went, and I stood in the door so she couldn't get out, and I said, Thelma, what are you doing? Every time I see you around church, you're acting like you're not supposed to be here. You're always sneaking around. What's, what's the deal? She dropped her head, and she said, I'm not supposed to be here. I said, what do you mean you're not supposed to be here? She says, when I was 16 years old, I was put out of the church. Isn't that a great phrase? Put out. In fact, for a while there, I was trying to get churches, you know, to, to take up a policy that every time they had a business meeting, they'd sort of vote who was the weakest link and then put them out, you know. But it never took. In fact, somebody said, well, if they do that, Ayla, you're going to be the first to go. So I, I kind of dropped the subject at that point. But anyway, they had put her out. And so when I'm standing there in the door, and I go, well, Thelma, I'm the pastor here. I think I can do something about that. So I had somebody go through the church minutes. You know, I wasn't going to do that. That's boring. But anyway, I got somebody to do that. I said, look, Thelma is 160 years old. When she was 16, you know, look through there. And sure enough, they found it where uh, two deacons of the church were walking down the street. Now, this is the inner city, you know, where the houses are right up on the sidewalk. And when they walked by her house, they saw through the window that Thelma was in her living room just dancing around. So being deacons, 
they had to do something about that. And so what they did is at the next business meeting, they voted to put Thelma out. Now, what it said in the minutes was that she was supposed to be put out for six weeks, and then the deacons were supposed to go and restore her. But deacons have a way of forgetting that part. And so Thelma, for 160-some years, had been running around thinking she couldn't come to church. And she had waited a long time until they got a new pastor, and then she started sneaking in. So anyway, I felt like I needed to do something about that. So at the next business meeting, I made a motion that we restore Thelma to full membership with all the privileges and all that, you know, that goes with that. And, uh, and she, uh, so we did that, and, but then I kind of went over the line. Because then I said, and also, I want to admit in the motion to say that Thelma uh, can dance anytime she wants to dance. Well, this one guy kind of looked, he was having trouble with that part, you know. And I finally, I remember I went over and I put my arm around and said, she's 160 years old. How much dancing do you think she's going to do? So anyway, it passed unanimously and she was restored. But, you know, 20 times in the Bible, you find people dancing for joy you know heaven heaven is a joyful place in fact c.s lewis puts it like this he says joy is the serious business of heaven so if you don't like to laugh if you don't like to giggle if you don't like smiling you may not like heaven in fact you might start making arrangements to go so no wait a minute i'm not going to do that um, I could get in trouble suggesting that. But maybe you ought to start trying to get used to joy while you're here. But you see, God is the most joyful being in the universe. In fact, we even see that he's joyful in, in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story. In fact, John Ortberg has rewritten the first chapter of Genesis as if God was not joyful. And so he writes, in the beginning, it was 9 o'clock, so God had to go to work. He began by filling out a requisition to separate the light from the darkness. He considered making stars to beautify the night, but thought it sounded like too much work. Besides, God thought, that's not my job. So he decided to knock off early, and he looked at all he had done, and he said, it will have to do. On the second day, God separated the waters from the dry land, and he made all the dry land flat and plain and functional, so that the whole earth, looked like the parking lot at Walmart. He thought about making mountains and valleys and glaciers and jungles and forests and waterfalls, but he couldn't figure, well, he just didn't figure it was worth the effort. So God looked at all that he'd done that day and said, it will have to do. And God made a pigeon to fly in the air and a carp to swim in the waters and a cat to creep upon the, ground, the dry ground. And God thought about making millions of other species of all sizes and shapes and colors, but he couldn't drum up any enthusiasm for any other animals. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about the cat. Besides, it was almost time for Oprah, and so he looked at all his hands as done, and he said, it will have to do. And at the end of the week, God was seriously burned out. So he breathed a great sigh of relief and said, thank me it's Friday. So let me ask you, do you remember back when you were joyful? Can you think back that far? Do you remember joy? Do you remember back when you'd say, do it again, Daddy, do it again, and you never got tired? You would tell the joke over and over and over again, and every time you thought it was as funny as the first time, the other people around you may not have thought that, but you thought it was funny. Do you remember that? Can you remember joy? The story goes that the angels came to God one day, and they said, uh, God, what are you going to do today? What are you going to do? He said, hmm, today, today I'm going to make daisies. And so he went down to the earth, and he made hundreds of thousands of daisies. And when the angels saw the daisies, they jumped up, and they hollered, and they screamed, and they giggled, and they laughed for joy. The next day, the angels came to God, and they said, God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And God said, hmm, today I'm going to make daisies. And so he went to another part of the earth, and he made thousands, hundreds of thousands of daisies. And when he did, the angels, they got so excited, they jumped and they screamed and they giggled and they laughed. And the story goes that every day since then, 
God has made daisies. And the angels have giggled and laughed and shouted for joy. Hmm. So why are we so bored? Chesterton said it. He said, we have sinned and grown old, but God has not. We have sinned and grown old, but God has not. What I find interesting about that is, is that usually when we sin, we sin thinking it's going to make us happy. We think, you know, if we have just a little bit more love in our life. And so we uh, do a little flirting, we do a little extramarital thing, thinking it's going to bring joy, more joy to us. But what it does is that it diminishes our capacity for joy. Because that's what sin does. It turns our bucket into a thimble. We think if we just had more money, then we'd be happy. So we fudge a little bit, cut a few corners, cheat a little, thinking it will make us happy. But what it does is it diminishes our capacity for joy. Hmm. You know, God's book, the Bible, is designed to show us how to find joy. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, I have taught you all of this so that my joy will prevail in you and so that your joy will be totally complete. All the teachings of Jesus, I mean, the one-third of the Gospels are the teachings of Jesus. He taught us all of that, and the mission statement for that was that so that we would know how to have joy. You know, when Jesus made all that wine, 72 to 180 gallons, he was saying, I am the Lord of joy. And here he's saying, I'm teaching you how to do it. He really is the Lord of joy. In fact, Isaiah, the prophet, when he's looking into the future, he's 600 years before Jesus comes on the earth, and he's looking at Jesus coming on the earth, and he's seeing that, and you know what he called Jesus? He called him the good news. The good news. Now, why is it important for us to get this? Why am I so bent on spending four weeks talking about how to get some joy in your life? Because it's important. Listen, church, you may not have noticed. Actually, I'm sure you have. But the church is not gaining ground in the United States. It's kind of losing it. And I think a big reason for that is that they just don't see the joy of the Lord in us. I mean, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We talk a lot about about love and showing love, and, and we need to do that. But let me tell you a little something. Love without joy kind of loses its flavor. It's kind of like salt without its flavor. So we've got to have this joy. When I was a young pastor, I was at a church that wasn't growing, and I was in, so finally I'd had it, and so I went to, and I took the pastor of the church down the street that was growing, and I took him out to lunch, and uh, after I fed him lunch, I said, man, I got to know, why is your church growing and mine not? And so he got out his napkin, you know, all important documents are put on napkins in restaurants first, that's where it all starts, and he drew two churches. One with a smiley face and one with a frown. And he said, so which one of those two churches would you rather go to? That's the best church growth lesson I have ever heard. And then when I think about people that aren't interested in church at all, how in the world are we going to let them know about Jesus when we don't have any joy? Martin Luther, he said... You have as much laughter as you have faith. Because you see, if you believe that Jesus is all that he said he was, if you believe that he is going to do for you all that he said he's going to do, it's joy. In fact, joy 
You mix a little oxygen with that. You mix, well, excuse me, with faith. If you mix oxygen with faith, you get laughter. Because laughter, all it is, is faith oxygenized. Hey, I said that word right, and I had to practice that word a lot. So let me just uh, give you some joy makers. And the reason I want to give you some joy makers, some quick ones here, um, is because I kind of sense that some of you are, uh, well, I want to say this in a politically correct way, some of you are uh, joy impaired, joy challenged. So let me just give you some joy makers. And the first one is to take responsibility for your own joy. Take responsibility for your own joy. Back when I uh, thought I was a good marriage counselor, I was doing some marriage counseling with, with a couple, and uh, they were sitting on the couch in my office, and um, they were telling me all about the troubles of their marriage, and at one point, the husband gets up, and he walks around behind the, um, the couch, and he puts his hands on his wife's shoulders, and he says, you know, she really tries. I mean, she really tries. But she just doesn't have what it takes to make me happy. And so being the good pastoral counselor that I am, I went over, I picked him up, and I threw him out the window. I didn't. I didn't do that. But man, I wanted to shake him and say, it's not her job to make you happy. There's not a spouse in the world that can make an unhappy person happy. Your happiness is between you and your God. Yeah, she can be the icing on the cake, but if you ain't happy, there's nobody in the world that can make you happy. You see, you've got to take responsibility for your own joy. As a pastor, I was talking to a woman who had just lost her husband, this uh, new widow, and I was doing what pastors do. We kind of What we do is we kind of go through the stages of grief with them and we kind of say and you're going to feel this and you're going to go through this and we're trying to say it's okay like like you're, there's going to be times when you're going to be angry you might be angry at the person that died you might be angry at god but you, it's okay it's okay because that's normal it's okay for you to feel like that and there's going to be times when you're depressed and you're just really really sad and that's okay and i kind of went through all of that and 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 when i was closing up the thing it's like the holy spirit said to me but you forgot something I remember taking her by the hands and looking her in the eye and saying, and also, there are going to be days when you feel good. There's going to be days when you're going to catch yourself smiling. There's going to be times when somebody tells a joke and you laugh. And that's okay. Listen, if you don't hear anything I've said today, listen to this. In the name of Jesus Christ, I give you permission to pursue joy. Did you get that? So take responsibility for your own joy. Joy maker number two, when do you start? Start today. Start today. Psalm 118 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Start right now. What another joy maker is, is practice celebration. That's why God put all those festivals in the Bible. He wants us to practice celebration. So find every excuse you can to celebrate. Don't miss a birthday. Don't miss an anniversary. Make up stuff. But practice celebration. Joy maker number four. Hang out with joyful people. Okay, I know some of you are just going to have to get on the phone this afternoon or in the morning and go and call somebody and go, look, preacher wants me to hang out with people who are joyful. You're joyful. Can we make an appointment? <laughs> but the point of this is this. Not everybody makes you smile. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't spend time with people that don't make us smile. In fact, I think the Bible's pretty clear that we're supposed to. In fact, that's what I call ministry. Helping, hanging out with people that don't make me smile. In fact, that's why we call it the work of the ministry. But for heaven's sakes, balance that out by spending some time with some joyful people. 
All right, joy maker number five. Be creative and interject joy into your low spots. So what's your low spot? Figure out what your low, low spot is and then figure out some kind of creative way. Usually it takes a lot of creativity to interject joy into those low spots. Like, for example, it could be work. A lot of people, work is their low spot. Well, listen to Ecclesiastes 5:18. It is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find joy in his toilsome labor. You know how Walt Disney would translate that verse? Whistle while you work. So how do you do that? Well, I've got a friend. He said, he, he said work had gotten so stressful and all the joy had left and had gone, been gone for a long time. So what he did is he went to work early one morning and before anybody else got there, he went to the sidewalk outside of his office window and he super glued a $5 bill. If you're a part of the Treasury Department, quit listening here. Uh, and he super glued a $5 bill to the, to the sidewalk. And then he went up and stood at his window and watched as people came in. And he got to laughing as people tried to swoop down and fall down, you know, all that kind of stuff. And other people heard him laughing and they came in and before the morning was over, everybody was standing at his window just waiting for somebody else to come to work. Just be a little creative. Okay, what's another low spot? Well, let's say uh, you're sick. I mean, when you're sick, it's really hard to be joyful when you're sick. But listen to Proverbs 17. It says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Can you say that? A cheerful heart is good medicine. Let's try that again. A so what does that mean? We're feeling down. We're feeling sick. We're feeling, well, what does it mean? Well, interject some joy into this low spot. I got a friend who had an operation. And, it, you know, after the operation, they get you out pretty fast these days and make you walk. And so he was doing, well, I call it the hospital shuffle. You've seen him. It goes like this. So he's got his pole, you know, he's got the bag on the pole. It's on wheels. He's staying close to the wall because, you know, he's, he's feeling a little wobbly. And he, he runs out of energy in the middle of this doorway. And he's standing in the middle of this doorway trying to catch his breath. And he looks up, and, and in the room with the doorway he's standing in is this bed, and this woman's in this bed, and she's looking at him. And he goes, did you see a guy with a yellow robe go by here? She said, no. Good, I'm ahead. <laughs> I got another friend, he's in the hospital. He said the whole ward was just sad. Everybody was dying. I mean, it was sad. Everybody was just grieving. It was sad. And so he says, so he got his wife to bring his uh, clown outfit. And what he did after his wife left is that he's too sick to get out of bed, and, but he... Uh, he puts on his clown wig and he puts on his clown nose and then he pulls the sheet up over his head and he gets real still. If you want to make a nurse nervous, this is a great way to do it. The nurse comes in. Mr. Hash, Mr. Hash, you okay? You okay? He goes, I feel like a clown. Interject joy into your low spots. Also, number six is remember Rule number six. Now, Ben Zander tells about rule number six. And rule number six, well, he tells it like this. There's two prime ministers that are meeting together. Uh, one of them's visiting the other. And as they're meeting together, uh, somebody comes running into the room. And he goes, there's some official. And he goes, Mr. Prime Minister, blah, 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 blah. He's all turned up. And, and the prime minister says, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, remember rule number six. And the guy gets real calm. He goes, okay, okay. And he goes out. A few minutes later, here comes another guy running in. He's going, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister. And, and he goes, remember, Mr. Secretary, remember rule number six. And this man just calms down. He goes, okay, okay. And he leaves the room, calm. And then a third person comes. There's always a third person. So here comes the third person. Does the same thing, and after the third person leaves, the, the visiting prime minister says, that's amazing, I've seen three people come in here just totally uh, bunkers, and you just say, what, can I ask you, what is rule number six? He said, well, that's easy, rule number six, I'd be glad to share that with you. No, rule number six is, don't take yourself so blankety-blank seriously. That's rule number six. 
And the other prime minister says, that's great. What, what, can you tell me what are the other rules? Oh, there are no other rules. There's just rule number six. Don't take yourself so seriously. In fact, Chesterton says, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Another way to make some joy is just practice comic relief. Practice comic relief. You see, under every situation, no matter how bad, there is a well or a reservoir of humor. Now, sometimes you've got to drill pretty far down to get to it, but it's there. My dad, when I was a kid, I remember he fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And the Battle of the Bulge wasn't like Normandy where you stormed the beaches. It, it, was, it, it lasted for months. And he lived through that. But I remember him telling me about the jokes they would tell each other when it really got bad and the cute little comments they made before they stormed a foxhole or a machine gun nest. Practice comic relief. Habakkuk chapter 3. If you know anything about Habakkuk, you know that the situation was bad, bad, bad. And in the middle of chapter 3, when he's telling about how bad he is, he writes, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Practice comic relief. Then another way, number eight of joy makers, is, is to keep your eye on the outcome. You know, as long as you know it works out in the end, you can kind of live through most anything with, with joy. And I just want to tell you, you know, you've heard this before, but if you read the end of the Bible, we win. In fact, listen to some of the last words in the Bible. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. All of that is gone forever. The night before my dad died, uh, he's in the hospital and he's, uh, he says, can you read something to me? What do you want me to read? Read something from the Bible. Read, 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 read to me about heaven. And so I get out the Bible and I read those words to him. And when I got to that point where I, it says, and there'll be no more pain, I remember he reached over and he grabbed my arm and he squeezed it and he said, that sounds so good. You know, that's the end. And if we keep our eyes on the outcome, we can live through whatever this world throws at us with some joy. I did a wedding one time. This was a complicated wedding. It was in a church. It was in a sanctuary. You know, I was down at the front. We were all there. It wasn't a very big wedding. I mean, there weren't a lot of people there. It was a big sanctuary. But, but, it, but I got, kind of got to the place. I'm doing the officiating. So I get to the vows, and I start the vows, and the bride faints. This can really disrupt a wedding. She just faints. So they bring out a metal, you know, one of those folding metal chairs. They set it up. They get her in the chair. They're fanning her. They're doing, they kind of get her going. And, and the groom kind of goes, come on, preacher, let's go. I want, I want this girl to be my wife. I want to marry her. Go, get, get going here. So I started the service again. And as soon as I started again, the maid of honor faints. This is a complicated wedding. They got her up on the front pew, you know, and, and, and the groom's going, come on, man, come on, man. I want, to, I want to marry this girl. I want this girl to be my wife. And so I start again. And as soon as I start again, the bride faints again and falls off the metal chair. So they get her up, and in fact, they're trying to get her up, and the groom is saying, come on, man, let's get this prayer going. Let's get to the end. And I went, I think she has to be somewhat conscious for this to be legal. <laughs> but finally, she comes to enough, and as soon as she comes to enough, man, I've I run through the rest of that ceremony, and I get to that point, and I, I pronounce them husband and wife, and the groom, he just grabs her up out of that chair in his arms, and he marches down the center aisle to the back door, and he turns around to the back door, and, and he looks at me, and he breaks into this great big smile, as if to say, I got my bride. You know, I don't know how it's really going to look, but in my mind, I picture that every day Jesus comes to the Father. And every day he says, is the day the day? Is the day the day? And the Father says, not today, but soon. It's one day closer than yesterday. Soon. But one day, one day, something's going to happen. Something's going to trigger it. Maybe it's... Uh, 
probably somebody is going to cross the line of faith and it's going to complete the number. might be one of you that finally steps across the line of faith and gives your heart to Jesus and it's going to flip the trigger. And then Jesus is going to come to the Father and say, is the day the day? And the Father is going to say, the day is the day. The day is the day. Go get your bride. And Jesus is going to come and he's going to gather us together and we're going to be his bride and he's going to set everything straight. No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. All of that will be gone forever. But you know, with that as the end, there is nothing that this world can throw at us that we can't live through with some semblance of joy. Father, let us hold our cups out to you right now and God, fill our cups overflowing with joy. Thank you, Lord.